Today, I'm going to barely talk about three rare books, and instead, I'm going to talk about rabbit holes. Uh, now, by rabbit holes, I mean when you get a book or you sit down to catalog it, you often notice something that may not be directly connected to the text. It might be a book plate, it might be a printer, and out of your curiosity, you start to investigate that, and before you know it, you've gone off onto some intellectual tangent, some meandering path in your research that consumes several hours, uh, often delightful hours, uh, and you know, after tea parties and Cheshire Cats, you wake up and you realize you have not even cataloged the book. So that is the pleasure of book selling. So let's start with uh, rabbit hole number one. Uh, this one has the little drink me vial on it there. This is a copy of The Raging Turk, or Bayezet II, by Thomas Goff, printed in London in 1656. Uh, now, Thomas Goff was a minor Jacobean dramatist. Uh, often his plays were produced in, in uh, academic settings like Oxford University, and sure enough, it says here, acted by the students. Uh, so why the students wanted to put on high school musical style The Raging Turk, I don't know. Maybe they could not uh, afford the performance license for Greece. Um, but the Turks, of course, in the Elizabethan mindset, represented some rapacious evil, some, uh, something that the Christians uh, could uh, you know, conquer the heathens. But I also think it gave them the opportunity to put on uh, interesting settings, stage design, costumes. Uh, the historical Bayezet II, uh, if you're a student of Jewish history, is perhaps best known as the Ottoman Sultan that helped the Sephardic Jews into Ottoman lands and escape after their expulsion from Spain in 1492. Uh, the play itself is not held in high regard. In fact, it's considered a derivative. Uh, most of it comes out of Richard Knowles' History of the Turks, a common book of the period, which I've had many copies of over the years. Um, the word derivative is always interesting. If you are in finance or if you are buying uh, Apple call options on Robinhood, it is a wonderful word. But if you are a bookseller, uh, it is the death knell of a sale because, of course, it means it lacks originality and who wants to sell a work that is not original? Uh, where was I going? Ah, oh, there's the rabbit. Follow him further down the hole. At the back of the book uh, is a list of books printed by Bedell and Collins, the printer in 1656. Now, at a, in a lot of old books, you often find these publisher lists, advertisements of books that were previously printed, books that are going to be printed, because the publisher had to advertise his wares. I love to read them because you often gain insight into the reading tastes of the period. Uh, and sure enough, as I went through, I see plays here, some of which I immediately recognize uh, by Ben Jonson, but my eye landed right upon The Merry Wives of Windsor by Shakespeare in quarto. Now, when a bookseller sees the word Shakespeare and quarto in the same sentence, his heart is set bibliographically a flutter, uh, and you do not want to be wearing one of those uh, Apple Watch pulse oximeters or you're going straight to the hospital. The reason we get so excited is because Shakespearean quartos represent uh, some of the rarest uh, and most fragile printed literature in the English language because of their close connection uh, with Shakespeare. Uh, by 1623, when the first folio of Shakespeare's works were printed, 19 quartos had already been printed, and those have been coveted by collectors for centuries and are often unassuming, thin little works that are worth a fortune. Uh, I should also say by quarto, it just refers to the size of the page and the way it's been folded. Those quarto printings uh, continued posthumously and after the printing of the first folio into the 17th century, uh, and those are also very desirable. 
but, and when I saw this one, I wondered, oh, I, because I'm familiar with many of the quartos, I haven't heard of that one, a 1656 Merry Wives of Windsor. And sure enough, I went to uh, the English short title catalog to look that up, and it does not exist. It is a bibliographical ghost printing. Uh, a ghost printing in bibliography is something that was not printed, uh, and because of an error that was repeated over the years, perhaps it gives it a semblance of reality, or it could have been a book that was indeed printed, but just uh, because of the ravages of time, no copy survived. So it's not clear uh, which is the case here, but I was delighted to find a bibliographical ghost uh, of Shakespeare. Uh, that, of course, set me down the path of wondering uh, what is the literature in general on bibliographical ghosts. And I did Google, and there was a wonderful article by George Watson Cole, a very famous American librarian who was a librarian at the Huntington Museum in California. And he had an article in the 1920s in the bibliographical papers. I'll include the link uh, below if you want to read it. Uh, where he discusses the origin of bibliographical ghosts, why they occur. Most of the fault is on the bibliographers, not the books. Uh, but I really loved his florid language where he says, for instance, I printed here, for more than two and a quarter centuries, the phantom has stalked through the bibliographies and histories of the English drama disguised in a tissue of conjectures. So the phantom of the bibliography. That should be an opera, right? So if you want to read about that, again, go check out the link and jump down that rabbit hole. But I have to move on to book number two. Uh, this one has a little drink me sign. I think this one turns you small. Uh, because actually uh, it is here the smallest woodcut elephant I have ever seen in print. But before I get to that puny pachyderm, uh, let me talk a little bit about the book. This is a commentary of John Calvin on the first book of Moses called Genesis, printed in London in 1578. Now, Calvin uh, was held in especially high esteem uh, in the Elizabethan period. And uh, I think a hundred of his books were printed in tra various translations before even 1640. So they're not rare in commerce. Now, I am a bit of an anti-Calvinist, uh, so I sincerely hope there is no Twitter mob of Calvinists that's going to come after me. Uh, and the reason I say that is because his teachings influence the iconoclasm that you find during this period, the destruction of imagery and religious works of art uh, that really started under Henry VIII. Uh, you know, perhaps there was a lull under uh, Queen Mary, but then it picked up again under Queen Elizabeth. And if you are a lover of uh, medieval art, that really led to the destruction and eradication of some wonderful works of art uh, and medieval imagery in the period. So I'm a little anti-Calvin, but thankfully not anti-Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, but back to the beast. Um, this is the printer's mark of Henry Middleton. And I was looking at it and wondering about that little elephant the other iconography is interesting here too, of Jesus as the good shepherd with a rampant lion and two heads. And interestingly, by 1580, the device had been changed and that elephant disappears. Now, who would eradicate a woodcut elephant? Uh, that is the, the big question. And I started to investigate that. And sure enough, there was literature on that. Um, the there's two schools of thought. One goes back to that Calvinist uh, iconoclasm that uh, Middleton decided to remove some of these pagan imagery, uh, images from his woodcut. Um, so he took out the elephant and the lion and the two heads. Uh, the other school of thought said, well, his emblem actually mirrored uh, the printer's signboards of the period, which were, they would put outside and which were some of the earliest commercial visual advertising ever made. See, we booksellers are always at the forefront. Uh, and he inherited that symbol uh, from Henry Wicks, who was another printer at an earlier date, who worked in Fleet Street at the sign of the Black Elephant. 
But by 1580, he wanted to disassociate himself, perhaps from that inheritance, establish himself more firmly as an independent uh, printer, and so removed uh, the elephant. Then I started to wonder more down that rabbit hole, where he got that little elephant from, what was the source for it? And once you do that, you open up an encyclopedia of information on the uh, meaning and symbolism of elephants from the medieval through the Renaissance period. And I wondered whether that was taken from a scientific cut of Conrad Gesner or Aldrovandi perhaps, or one of the medieval bestiaries of the period of which I'm so fond. I could not source that image after about 30, 45 minutes. But that is, uh, will remain a mystery to me, but that is rabbit hole uh, number two. Uh, this book, we will uh, give it a little eat me cracker. Uh, now, we'll, let's see, uh, where should I go with this? Uh, like the Cheshire Cat says, if you don't know where you're going, it doesn't matter. Uh, these are the certain miscellany tracks of Thomas Brown. Thomas Brown was one of the great uh, English polymaths of the 17th century, and I think one of the single most underappreciated writers ever. Uh, he is very readable even today, and his books are surprisingly affordable for 17th century books. Um, he's a little bit of like uh, David Sedaris with some Baroque eloquence mixed in. Uh, to give you an example of that, um, uh, here is a chapter on his famous Bibliotheca Abscondita, the lost or imagined library where he discusses from his own imagination rarities of several kinds scarce or never seen by any man now or living. So these are non-existent books, sort of like going full circle, tweedle um, Tweedledee back to the ghost printings. Uh, and to give you an example of how forward thinking he was, here is one uh, on a submarine herbal. That's a very early use of that term submarine, where he's describing a manuscript showing, uh, you know, algae and everything under the sea. So who wouldn't uh, like to come across uh, that ancient manuscript there? But I didn't choose this book to discuss uh, Thomas Brown. What caught my attention was actually the book plate, and that is our rabbit hole there. It says Ex Libris, Arthur B. Spingarn. Arthur Spingarn was one of the great American civil rights leaders. He was really at the forefront of racial justice, and he took the side of W.E. Du Bois instead of Booker T. Washington in that famous divide. He went on to become the president of the NAACP, and what is truly remarkable about his career, at least for a bookseller standpoint, is he formed the greatest collection of African Americana describing the African American experience. So he was very early on to collect books and manuscripts and periodicals uh, in that field. And if you want to know where you're going, you have to know where you came from. Uh, that uh, is all kept now at Howard University. Uh, and is a highly important uh, um, collection for researching in the field. Uh, his biography is particularly fascinating, and I spent some time reading that. Uh, the other thing I noticed about the book plate uh, was the designer. It says Ruth Reeves, who I never heard about. Ruth Reeves was an important American woman textile designer. And this book plate uh, was done in 1915 and shows a little bit of that uh, erotic Art Nouveau influence, maybe from Aubrey Beardsley. But by 1920, she had studied under uh, Ferdinand Roger and uh, had taken some Cubist elements into her work. Uh, and then in the 1920s, she got into fashion illustration, Women's Work Daily, one of the great fashion periodicals of the period actually sponsored a remarkable competition where they asked anybody from all works of life to submit designs to them, uh, but they should use non-Western sources and motifs. Uh, so that was very unusual for the period to actually instruct people to look towards uh, non-Western materials. And Ruth Reeves took that up hook, line, and sinker and started to explore Native American motifs and 
South and Central American ones, especially Guatemalan, which she incorporated into her textile designs. She actually produced the carpets and the wall coverings at Rockefeller Center, which I love because I go there every year for the Christmas show, of course. Uh, and I haven't really even analyzed uh, the imagery in the book place. That is yet another rabbit hole. But uh, like they said in Alice in Wonderland, I hear my sister calling, so it's time to wake up by the tree. Uh, so I hope you've enjoyed uh, some of those uh, diversions in the rare book world, and you will tune in uh, and subscribe for more fun and insights into rare books, collecting, uh, and the trade itself.